so welcome to the third focus group meeting on our water utility resource management plan. Um, the purpose of these focus group meetings is to provide an update to uh, so members of the elected officials of City of Moab, uh, Grand County, and San Juan County, who are the members of the coalition uh, that I'll talk about in a moment. Um, format for the night's meeting is I'll just give a brief five minute introduction with some items, and then I'll turn it over to Ben Miner, who's our leading the consultant team on the project. And then at the end, we're scheduled for two hours from six to eight. Uh, we'll take questions from the focus group members first, and then we'll take uh, questions from the members of the public. So besides just being an opportunity to uh, present to the focus group members, it's also a way for the public to uh, zoom in and participate. We're also recording this uh, meeting if uh, anyone wants to look at it later. So with that, I'd like to go ahead and uh, thank you everyone for, for coming here tonight. Appreciate you taking the time out in your evening. And I'll start with just sharing my screen. A brief PowerPoint. Here we go. So the Water Utility Resource Management Plan, or the acronym is the WORM. Um, I'd like to talk about what the plan is and will do. Kind of an overview first. Uh, it's a cooperative effort funded and developed by the three primary public water suppliers. That's a key element of understanding why we're doing this plan. Uh, these are the largest ones within the Moab Spanish Valley. Uh, those three being Grand Water and Sewer Service Agency, which is primarily unincorporated area of the county, Grand County, City of Moab within Moab City Limits primarily, and then the San Juan Spanish Valley Special Service District. Uh, the intended goal is ensuring resilient management of water resources for residents and visitors to the Moab Spanish Valley for the next 100 years. This is the first time an effort of this magnitude has been undertaken, uh, to my knowledge, and I'm pretty sure that's true as we've researched it. Uh, it will consider surface water and groundwater sources and uses. Uh, it's being developed by Hanson, Allen & Luce, which is Utah licensed water resources consulting engineering firm, and they'll uh, be presenting the information here in a few minutes after I'm done. Uh, it's an engineering study uh, that's moving forward. It summarizes water sources and system production capacities. That is the ability of the infrastructure that we have now, not only from a, uh, from a source standpoint, it summarizes and reviews types and quantities of water needed uh, into the future. It considers possible effects of drought and climate change, though those are very difficult to uh, quantify. It identifies conservation goals and options, evaluates alternatives of sharing water resources. Um, we're all in the same Valley, um, there's we should be working together as opposed to against each other. And that's one of the beautiful things about this process is the three largest public water suppliers, which is defined by Utah law, are working together on this effort. Um, it identifies potential solutions to meet existing and future water supply needs, including groundwater development, cooperative use, aquifer storage and recovery, conservation, treatment of water from the Colorado River, wastewater treatment reuse, agricultural water use optimization. It reviews water rights and implications on water rights planning. Uh, we will have conceptual design of alternatives, which we'll be speaking about, Ben will be speaking about tonight, him and his team. Uh, it considers legal and regulatory implications of those projects potential projects, and it includes coordination with key stakeholders. It also includes public engagement. Now we've had these, this is our third focus group and it's open to the public. Um, we've encouraged them and put it out on social media. It's uh, highlighted on the city's 
uh, front page on the, our website. And we also have scheduled a November 7th uh, public open house to discuss the future scenarios, the implications and more detail of what we're gonna present tonight. Uh, it will be at the Grand Center and I believe it's from five until seven, though we'll have that posted as well. And that'll be an in-person meeting. Uh, and we've had one of those already uh, back in May, I believe. Uh, and we'll prepare a water utility resource management plan that can be adopted by member agencies that I've discussed members of the coalition and be used as a framework for achieving the goal, again, of ensuring resilient management of water resources for the residents and visitors for the next hundred years. So that's what the plan will do. That's what it's designed to do. That's what our scope of work is for our consulting firm. That's what the agencies have agreed upon in the memorandum of understanding. Now I'd like to talk about what the plan does not do. And I think that this might help clarify some questions that uh, people have. Uh, we've answered questions from stakeholders. We've answered questions from the public. I believe we have an FAQ posted on our website, but I wanted to elucidate more clearly um, what the plan does not do. It does not produce any additional aquifer groundwater studies, nor does it replace any that currently exist. The, we went through this cycle of the USGS, the Ken Colm studies, and then UDWR has done their own internal um, evaluation of those studies. And this does not um, contradict them in that we're not doing another aquifer ground study, groundwater study. And we're not suggesting the others be thrown out. Um, it does not identify groundwater safe yield values. That is the state's purview. If they elect to use this information, that'll be up to the state uh, to do that. But you know, we're not declaring safe yield uh, has been exceeded or not exceeded. Uh, that's not part of our scope of work. Uh, it will not require anyone to lose their water rights. We were asked that at the public previous public meeting. Um, that's not part of what we're undertaking here. We will not evaluate private water rights or sources either. Uh, it's the water rights for the primary uh, public water suppliers in the coalition, it, which includes, by the way, the Moab Irrigation Company. Uh, their, uh, GWISA is a large um, user of those, those water rights. Um, it does not produce a policy document that will regulate water usage on specific properties. In other words, the government's not coming for people's water at their houses if they have their own well. Uh, it will also not produce a detailed capital improvement plan. Ben's gonna share with us tonight uh, conceptual level costs that can help guide policy making, uh, but it doesn't come up with a, hey, we're gonna do all this detailed improvements in the next five years, which is a typical time frame for capital improvement plan. That may be a logical follow-up in the future, but that's not part of this effort now. It also does not advocate for or against growth in the Valley. Uh, this is an engineering study dealing with the information as we know, we're not, as public water suppliers, we're obligated to provide water to our users but that doesn't say that we're promoting growth or we're against growth in the Valley. That's not a political statement from this study. And it clearly does not supersede city or county legislative land use authority. Uh, there are some folks who seem to want to mix the two. Um, it's nothing that we're mixing here. It's clear that this is a water study. This is not a land use uh, study that the city or county will rely upon to make their uh, land use decisions, in my opinion. Um, with that overview uh, about what the plan does and does not do, I'd like to now turn it over to uh, Ben Miner, who's the lead on Hanson Allen and Lewis's team. And I think that what we'll do is if we can, we'll uh, go through Ben's presentation at the end. We'll ask questions first from the focus group and then from the public. Uh, there you go, Ben. Thanks, Chuck. I, I appreciate the introduction. And I appreciate your your summary of what the plan is and isn't. I, I think that's very well stated. Um, <clears throat> we're excited to work with the communities, uh, Moab and the and the counties on on this 
important project. Uh, I, I would just say to start off with, before I get too, too far into my slides, that really the essence of what we're doing is recognizing that growth is likely to occur. This study doesn't control growth, as Chuck said. It's, it's, a, it's a function of planning. Um, a lot of times developers have influence, if not one year, another year, and often they will bring, you know, bring growth. And I, I certainly think that there will probably be an influence towards growth. Certainly that's to a degree within your, your control as the land, uh, land controlling agencies. But this looks at water use for possibly for 100 years. That's a long time to look at. Those are projections we, we have made. Uh, you know they're not they're not going to be totally right uh, projections. You know never never are, but we think uh, we've done a, a pretty good job based on what we've seen in other communities and what's potential in in in, in the Moab Spanish Valley to, um, to to grow. And we've made some projections that way. And then we just ask the question: If this growth occurs, how how might you how might you handle it? How might you provide water? for these residences and businesses and, and in industries and, and the ag uses over time. And, and that's really the, the essence of, of what we're looking at. These are, you know, feasibility level uh, solutions. You, as communities may choose not to go after some, you may choose to go after all of them. We don't know that's, that's for, for you to choose. So, with that, let me go ahead and share my slides. Hopefully I can get this to work. Okay. All right. Can can everybody see the uh, see the opening chart there? Yeah, I can see it. This first slide. Okay. Uh, now uh, I have a few repetitive slides, basically covering some of the things that Chuck talked about. I'll breeze through those. We, you know, his, his introduction is better than than mine, and we'll, we'll you know defer to his introduction just in, in time savings. Then we'll get into some other other issues. Um, we've already talked about the coalition members. I'll move on from that. Uh, the consultant team, uh, Hans Noun Luce, I'm Ben Miner, project manager, uh, Katie uh, and Dan are both on who have done a lot of the legwork with, with me and for me, and I appreciate their help. Um, Sunrise Engineering with uh, Devin Shields has provided some information in support of uh, Gwis's work, and I appreciate the, the good work he has done, and our public involvement from Logan Simpson with Jim and, and Sophie. Uh, working a little bit behind the scenes, but tr trying to make sure that we have a delivery of, of information to you so, th so that you understand what, what is going on. Uh, just very briefly on background, Chuck talked about a lot of it, but you've, you've had a sustained growth. You, you have a lot of tourism growth. Uh, you, you know, you've seen uh, a lot of uh, hotels going in. You've seen a, a, a lot of uh, Airbnb and, and similar, similar kinds of uh, rentals, nightly rentals, and obviously between the residential commercial growth and, and these uh, tourist growths, you'll see uh, increasing water water supply, uh, water demand, and you'll see more in the future. And of course, uh, there is concern as to how to, how, how to supply the water. Um, agency uh, project goals, uh, agency, let's have some agency cooperation. In coordination, let's have consistent water policies. Let's consider sharing water resources so each uh, individual agency maximizes the, the value of its resources. Let's create a, a framework for the next 100 years of uh, how to provide the water. Uh, um, there'll be uh, you know potential solutions we, we, are, we have evaluated, we'll continue to evaluate, and we'll, we'll plan for the future. Uh, let's let me tell you what we have done to date. We have received and reviewed uh, lots of data from from lots of sources. We have met with coalition members. We've met with stakeholders. 
Uh, we've met with uh, representatives of the Division of Water Rights. We have held workshops uh, with, with stakeholders in the public. We have done population projections. Based on those population projections, we have done some water demand projections, and we have evaluated possible sources and, and some costs, which we'll get into in more detail later. Public involvement. Uh, we've had some outreach to date, uh, information on, on the Moab City website. We have had uh, stakeholder interviews. We've had social media posts. We've received and responded to a number of comments from the public. And we had a public open house on, on May 24th, where we, we were with you in, in Moab and, and talked with many of you. And, and that was uh, great, great to get to know get to know those that came. There's more public outreach to come. We have an open house on November 7th, and we also will have a plan presentation uh, a little bit later as we formulate the draft plan, and, and that will become uh, a document that everyone can look at and comment on. Uh, and, and then I, I just have this little note that as, as we study the different aspects of, of, of water use in the Valley, uh, you know, we find new data sources, people provide us new data sources and new perspectives, and we just incorporate those as we go. So sometimes a, a number that you saw several months ago might not be the same number that you see today. We we just want to make sure those are as accurate as possible as we go through the, the process. Okay, let's look at the study area for a minute. Uh, here's, a, here's a map. Yeah, it's the Moab Spanish Valley, uh, city of Moab, basically to the Colorado River, and then uh, south uh, through the Guisa area, down past Ken's Lake, and into the north end of, of San Juan County. And so that's that's our study area. Projections. We have made some population projections. We looked uh, primarily, we pulled these out of the different agency master plans. We looked at conservation plans, 40-year plans, transportation plans, a bunch of different plans. And we also had discussions with each of the coalition members and worked together to get some, some population projections. Here, here they are. Uh, you can see that right now, all of our agencies put together, we estimate around 11,000 people, and then that will grow to our 100-year estimate of about 50,000. We could be wrong on that, you know. I I have a little saying: the population projections are wrong a certain percent of the time, and that percent is one hundred. Right? You, you do your best, you, the best you can, and you keep reevaluating from time to time, and uh, that will that will guide uh, that that will guide future decisions as as you reevaluate. But right now, we we think these are pretty good with the data that's available. Hmm. Now, here are. Uh, based on the population, we have developed equivalent residential connections. Uh, we have the current ones and, and projections. Now, as a reminder, it, it, it sometimes is nice to have a consistent uh, measure of water use. And the, the measure that's often used is the equivalent residential connection. We look at single family homes primarily and see how much the average single family home uses and then all other uses, we we assign the same value. As an example, if a if a business uses five times as much water as a, the average single family home, then we would say it has five equivalent residential connections. And, and then that's a measure where we can count all different types of water uses at with a single with a single unit. So right now we're about six thousand uh, in the study area, and that could grow to you know maybe maybe twenty seven thousand. Um, and we have taking, taken the ERC count and then we convert that into water demand. Certainly it's an estimate. Uh, we, we've done this a lot. We've looked at lots of data in different communities over many years. And we think we have some pretty good measures on how to convert the, the ERCs to water demand. We have looked at, uh, the water use. We've looked at state standards. We've looked at, um, usage as described in the master plans, and then we've come up with, with some values that we feel pr pretty confident with. 
We also have outdoor use. This is a map from the state showing uh, how much water it takes in different areas to to irrigate. It should be no surprise that Moab area, it, it takes more water to irrigate an acre than it would in a high mountain community. Obviously, you're 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 dry and it can get hot. And and this is just a reflection of that. So as we make our outdoor projections, we recognize that uh, the outdoor use here is in Moab is relatively higher than in other areas, in some other areas. And so here we have our 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 demand projections. And and by the way, I know I'm going through these pretty quickly, but this information will appear in the report in detail. So if if you don't catch something as we're going through, I'd be glad to talk about it later during question time, or you can wait for it to appear in the report. Um, and also our past two focus group meetings went into these this portion in a lot more detail. Right. Anyway, I, I realize I'm going rather briskly through them. I, I don't want you to feel that, um, you know, we're, we're not willing to talk about them. Uh, I, I want to spend as much time on them as, as, as you need to be comfortable with the numbers. Uh, indoor, right now, we have about an estimate of about 2,900 uh, acre feet per year use. And that number will jump to possibly 12,000. On the outdoor use currently, we are probably using 4,400 acre feet annually as a, as a community, and we'll probably get to about 12,900. In total, right now, we're probably using 7,500 acre feet uh, indoor and outdoor, and that will grow to possibly 25,000. 25, now, of course, it depends on uh, what measures, whether there's conservation measures or, or land control or something, uh, land use control that comes later on. Uh, from the communities that that could reduce that, or uh, obviously, if there's uh, growth beyond what we see, then it, that could be more as well. Okay, so so let me back back up one slide. So this is this this average annual use that's acre feet per year. Uh, one one of the other measures we look at is is peak day. Now peak day is is uh, is the idea that. During winter, for example, on any given day, you'll use less water than on the hottest day of the year. The hottest, you know, the day with the highest use, which is usually one of the high, high hot days, is, is the day with the highest use is, is the what we call the peak day. Um, one measure, of course, is how much water do we use all year, but we also like to look at peak day because that tells us how much water you need to have coming from your sources. Often you'll have all of your sources running uh, all day long or for several days during the hot summer, summer summer days. During winter, some of the sources might be shut off for, for weeks. And so this is just a reflection of that. Uh, if, if we look at all of the uses right now, we feel that there's about 10,000 gallons per day, excuse me, 10,000 gallons per minute is the peak number. And that could grow up to go up to as high as you know approximately 37,000 gallons per minute. So as we as we look through sources those, those are the two measures we look at annual usage and, and peak day usage as well. Let's talk about recent annual production. Um, this is build and production volume. Uh, and, and the difference there is that of course the wells or, or the springs, whatever your source is, produces a certain amount. Um, most of that gets built to the customers, but, but there are leaks and some goes out through a fire hydrant. Um, so some of it's lost due to maintenance. And so uh, there's a difference where the, the amount build is, is always less than, than the production. And so um, we're showing here that, uh, th I mean, this is the case. Uh, overall, your production is about 70, 7,800 acre feet. And, uh, you know, something less than that is being billed. Katie, do you want to have any other comments on context for these values? Um, 
on the Moab Irrigation Company volume, that's just the volume that they intend to deliver each year. And so we've assumed that that stays pretty, uh, you know, pretty consistent. Um, but other than that, no, not, I think you've explained what, what I go over on this. All right, thank you. Oh, uh, that, that was that that was for 2021. Here's 2022. Uh, same same idea. I We're... think on on this one, and I guess this does apply to the last slide as well, particularly on the Gwisa or on the Gwisa columns. This does include water that comes through Sheely Tunnel into Ken's Lake. And so that can include a significant amount of storage that stays in Ken's Lake. And it also includes seepage and evaporation out of Ken's Lake. Thanks. So, so if you look at the agency total being uh, like 6,100 acre feet versus the production of, of 9,000, that looks like a pretty big difference. But once again, it, it's a reflection of, of there, this being a fairly complex system. Uh, some of it is not intended to be billed. Uh, ideally, you build it as much as possible, but certainly if there's seepage or evaporation or these kinds of things, that's not going to get billed. Okay, let's talk about sources and, and production. Uh, and just a, a, a note on the safe yield, as, as Chuck pointed out early on, that safe yield number has not yet been determined by the state of Utah. Um, you know, there will be continued uh, review of data and collection of data over time to, to you, you know, at some point come to that number has not been determined yet. Okay, here's, here's the production capacity. Uh, this is, uh, in, in case of uh, Moab, you know, you have the wells and springs can produce about 4,400 gallons a minute. WISA has wells and springs, and um, uh, they have their they have the capacity of 5,700 gallons a minute. Uh, and that includes the Mill Creek flow via Sheely Tunnel that goes into Ken's Lake. Okay. San Juan uh, Valley Special Service District. Um, right now, they have a, a 50 gallon a minute well. Uh, the the well is actually capable of producing more water, but uh, currently there are production restrictions based on some water right issues. They are, you know, working on getting more water out of that in a from a regulatory sense. And so over the next few years, that number will probably go up. And then we have uh, Mob Irrigation Company. We're showing at twenty nine hundred gallons a minute. So so currently we're we're talking about. Uh, 13, roughly 13,000 gallons per minute capacity from all the agencies. Do a summary of water rights. This summary sheet talks about the water rights. Um, Moab currently has uh, about 9,500 acre feet in water rights. Guisa has about 11,000. San Juan Valley, uh, 5,000 in Moab Irrigation Company. Six, uh, 6,500, so that comes to about 32,000 um, 32, acre feet. We also just have some information on there estimating that if someone decides to transfer some of these water rights to the Colorado River, certainly you couldn't do all of them, M maybe could do some. That That's really an, uh, a question that would have to be explored further in a regulatory sense to see what what could be accomplished if if the communities decide to go that direction? Uh, let's talk about source solutions. Uh, so so this is um, a a list of different source solutions we we have developed and our estimates of how much water might be available. Now, as uh, as a community decides to develop these sources, some of them will be more, uh, they will be, they're maybe more realistic than others. As you get into them and do a lot of detailed research and studies, sometimes they work out great and sometimes they don't. And so this is our estimate at this point. 
I think what will happen is communities will decide to go after some of these. There'll be more study and, and then you'll see what's achievable. So um, the ideas we have is uh, you might be able to save with conservation, maybe 700 acre feet a year. It, that's um, pretty optimistic and aggressive projection, but uh, you know maybe it's possible. There could be outdoor water eating restrictions, could possibly save 900. And, they, and, and of course, those, those, aren't, those aren't new water. That's just using the water you have and, and finding a way to re reduce demand. Uh, as far as new sources, uh, in, the, in the valley, there could be some more wells. We have estimated 2,800 acre foot per year in, in additional wells. Uh, San Juan Valley Special Service District has the Behind the Rocks well. Uh, it's uh, a known source. Uh, there's been testing. It would, it would take some some transmission capacity, con, you know, construction. That's maybe 100 acre feet per year right now. Agricultural water conversion is the idea that uh, uh, people that own farms right now might decide to sell those farms and and sell the water rights. A lot of the way, or a lot of the the times, that the way this happens is that. A developer may show interest. A person may be a point in their farming career that they are no longer interested in farming. Uh, in some cases, they try to hand it on to a family member. Sometimes those family members are not interested in continuing the tradition, and the developers will will buy it. And so that that water then converts from agriculture to to municipal water through that through that process. Uh, uh, gray water reuse is something that probably won't yield to any significant amount of of water savings but but you know there could be some there uh, if there are enough people interested next we have waste wastewater treatment reuse you have a, a great new water treatment plant that is discharging uh water to the, you know currently to the Colorado River uh, you as the city grows you will you will see more and more water going to that wastewater treatment plant Almost all of the water that is used inside homes and businesses will arrive at the, the wastewater treatment plant. It'll be cleaned up, and then you can decide whether you have a way to use that. Sometimes it takes additional processing. It can take additional pumping. Uh, there's more investment there, but it, it is a, a potential source of water. Uh, Mill Creek may have uh, more water that can be developed. Currently, some of the water goes to uh, Ken's Lake, of course. Some of it goes downstream, eventually reaching the, the Colorado. There is a possibility that, that more of that water could be used. Uh, I, I think the community is probably going to want to keep some, some strong in-stream flows from Mill Creek. And so it, it would take a, a a little bit more work in ter terms of, in terms of monitoring to decide uh, if there's additional water there, but but it is a potential source. And then uh, of course the Colorado River's there. Uh, you, you know I look at the Colorado River in two ways. One is we know that it's over appropriated, and we know that recently there's been a drought and its sustainability is 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 questioned. On the other hand, you have a really big river right at your doorstep. And so th those, those are the, the different ideas that the communities will have to work with, whether they want to try to go after that or, or not. Anyway, that's, you know, the decision the communities can make. Okay, let's talk about need. Now, these are just some charts that we've shown trying to project over time and I realize that some of them may be, may be a little hard to see. Uh, this one for, for the total study area, it shows supply versus demand. Now, there, there are two lines that are horizontal lines. One is supply on the highest recent year, and the other one is uh, if, if you pushed your wells, if you got average use at median use out of your surface sources and and then used 100% of your wells. Now the one thing I'll say about the hot you know the supply on the highest 
highest supply during a recent year is you don't supply supply more water than you need. So that's always going to be something of a low a lower number. Um, and then the blue line is what we see is low hanging fruit on a projection. So with that in mind, uh, you can see that the supply, you know, you're you're good for now. Uh, there's there's no emergency on supply for anybody right now. Uh, as as time goes on, you'll need to continue to do water planning to see how to cover that growth, and that that's what we're trying to show with this slide. Um, this is uh, specific to to Moab. Um, same story, basically. Uh, if there's a lot of growth, you'll, you'll need to come up with new supplies of water. Clearly, there's no emergency right now. You you have good supplies of water. You're okay. Um, over time, that could change. Uh, Guisa, really the same thing. They maybe have a little bit more than than the city, but in, in terms of their their. Uh, currently developed supplies versus demand, but once again, at some point in the future, uh, they'll they'll catch up with that and, and need to develop more water. Um, and then, South Valley, excuse me, uh, San Juan, sorry, San San Juan Valley. Um, right now, uh, they have enough. Uh, there there has been a lot of development discussion. Uh, in the area, and if if some of the developments come to fruition, they could demand a lot of water. I don't know that they have figured out yet where that water might come from. Those those plans are, you know, are still in the works. But once again, they have enough water right now. But as growth happens, additional sources will be necessary. Uh, peak day. Um, uh, same same story right now. Um, there's there's enough there's enough capacity to meet the need. Over time, that will change. So peak, peak day, same story, doing okay for now. Okay, let's talk about some projects. Um, first of all, let's talk about the regulatory and administrative programs. Uh, these are essentially. The ones, the ones I talked about where we conserve water or implement restrictions, people can voluntarily conserve. Uh, you can have regulations and restrictions that limit, limit uh, outdoor watering. You know, you could require uh, water tolerant plants or no lawns or, you know, other things have been done in other communities. Uh, um and um anyway th there can be some costs associated with this in terms of administering the administ administering the program with some some staff and outreach and so forth so when you when you see costs associated with this it's really related with uh public outreach and administration um here's just a chart where we 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 talk about essentially what a what I said with this shows a little more detail. You can do low flow fixtures. You can re repair leaks more aggressively, low water use plants, et cetera. And of course, you can get uh, more aggressive in the regulatory restriction arena. Uh, I, I will say that what I have seen in the past with, with these is um, if a community is, is really into them and, and the, the community re really likes the idea, they they can be effective uh, if the community you know doesn't want to support them then then it's hard to get them to work it really takes some community buy-in uh, let's talk about groundwater monitoring system so there there have been a lot of questions about what is the safe yield of the aquifer and and how much water can be removed from the aquifer um, and there is some data available on it, but really there, there's not there's not enough data. Um, th this aquifer needs to be studied uh, more thoroughly, and we need to get a better understanding of of its capacity. And this could take some agency cooperation. Uh, 
but essentially I think it would be good to 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 have a you know some sort of uh interlocal agreement or a district or something like that uh and put some money into this and then establish a kind of a more formal program it would it would me measure water levels throughout the valley it may go so far as to drill wells in key locations that are not covered uh, both to develop, help develop the geology, understanding of the geology and, and water quality and, and water levels. And so th this, you know, would be develop a plan, collect data, do some groundwater modeling, you know, develop a criteria and an action plan. What do you do when the water quality hits a certain level or what do you do when the water levels get down to a certain point? Um, and, and then you, you could uh, make recommend you know get recommendations for future water projects. But anyway, it would provide you mo you more data. Data. Um, agricultural efficiency programs. Um, the 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 federal government helps uh, provide some funding for farms to be more efficient. Uh, I, I don't know that I necessarily see the communities funding that, although perhaps they could, but I, I think they could have with public outreach and some administering outreach and, and, and helping do some cooperation with federal agencies to get funding. And uh, the, the effect would be that the water used for agricultural agriculture could be covering essentially the same land area, but with, with less water use. And so that, that could be a, a, a savings as well. Uh, let's talk about groundwater wells. So this source is new wells, in, which includes uh, in, in San Juan, the behind the rock well, and, and also uh, agricultural conversion wells. In, in other words, we can see, uh, we can see more, more wells in, in the aquifers, you know, proceed on that cautiously, but um, some folks believe there's more capacity left there. And so uh, the nice thing about wells is they're fairly inexpensive and provide high quality water. So if 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 uh, you know if we can drill some more wells, that would be great. The behind the rocks well is a very specific well which which could be developed. And then there are ag wells that are currently obviously working for irrigation on farms. Uh, there could be a conversion. wouldn't necessarily be the same well because, Drinking water has specific construction requirements, but maybe one of the ag wells would be taken out of service and the uh, a new well, a new municipal well would be drilled in the same spot and, and that water, the water rice would then be converted. Uh, I have some charts here. Uh, apologize that the text might be small to see. Uh, what this shows is that you can see kind of the uh, blue, uh, the blue squiggly blue lines. Those are areas that we think could potentially be used for well development. There could be other areas as well. It's behind the rocks well, uh, south of Ken's, Ken's Lake, um, south and, and you know west, uh, west is, is a possibility. And then uh, once again, th this this figure is hard hard to see in this meeting. Uh, we'll have it in the report, but we've just identified areas that are currently uh, being used for agriculture that could possibly be switched over later. And, and once again, let me emphasize that we're, we're not going to take anybody's water away. Don't have the ability to do so. Don't want to. But um, as the far as the farmers decide they want to maybe cash out on the farm, sell it to a developer or or sell it to one of the communities that would like the water, then that could be an opportunity to to receive that water as um, as a municipal supply. Here's just a uh, enlarged enlarged figure showing some areas that are currently, used for agriculture. If you see your property there, don't panic. You're you're in control of your property. We're not suggesting otherwise. Uh, let's talk about reuse a little bit. Uh, this is the, you know, residential or gray water reuse. 
These are private systems where you take your gray water, meaning, you know, water from your, your sink or uh, washer, and it's injected essentially underground. There's a, uh, a lot of plumbing code and state requirements about how this can be done safely. But theoretically, someone could save some water by, by, by doing this. Um, of course, if, if someone injects water underground for outdoor irrigation here, it won't show up at the treatment plant. So sometimes it's, it's not a direct benefit in that sense. But, uh, you know, some, some people might be interested in this. I, I haven't seen it implemented on a large scale basis in Utah. And so I, there'll always be a few people that are interested in it. I'm, I'm not sure I see this as really something that's going to produce much water. Uh, we have a figure in here just uh, showing how, how that could be done. Now, let's talk about uh, reuse of treated water from the, the Moab wastewater treatment plant. Uh, this, this water comes out pretty clean now. Um, if it were cleaned up a little bit further, it could be uh, used on, on, on for outdoor use. Uh, would require some pumping systems and piping, which we'll, we'll show in a minute a figure for that. Um, it'd be unlikely to, to be used for indoor use. That is not something that is happening right now in Utah or, or most of the country. But uh, there, there are treatment plants that will clean it up enough to use outdoor. Uh, Tuala City, for example, is, is one that I know treats it to that level. And there are some others. But generally it's it 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 does require more treatment to to get to that level okay uh now here's a figure and what this figure does is, um is down on the left side of the figure kind of near the top you may or may not be able to read uh the wastewater treatment plant and and then it shows a red line uh the, which goes up past Ken's Lake. That's a transmission line. Because of the elevation, there'd have to be a number of pump stations. So the idea is uh, the water is cleaned up to a level where it can be used outdoors. It is pumped up to a storage tank, which then is pumped up from there to another storage tank. And it, it's just a step system to potentially get it um, to the high elevation side of the valley and and that this is this shows it being shared among the different communities. Anyway, that's what it is essentially a pump system for outdoor use using treated water from the wastewater treatment plant. Pressurized irrigation, excuse me, pressurized irrigation systems used for outdoor watering. Uh, Moab City doesn't have one right now. Some communities do. You know, maybe you get some funding and invest in. A, a system in all or part of the city for outdoor, uh, you, you know, just a, a secondary system. Uh, Guisa has a system in some areas. They could maybe expand that. Uh, there's a possibility of altering Ken's Lake to get increased storage. And, and once again, also for San Juan, uh, they could construct a a system as well if they if they wanted that that would help take advantage of water that is not of high enough quality for drinking water but is high enough for outdoor use here's just a figure uh showing what that might look like uh, essentially it, it it you know it's a very expensive proposition because you have to build a lot of new lines uh the the advantage is that it re reduces the pressure on the uh, on on the drinking water system, uh, so so you can get get more more service out of that. And then, of course, you can use the lower quality types of water uh, if, if they become available. Once again, uh, here's just a figure, pretty simple, just showing that you, you know you you could build one in the lab. 
expand the one for Guisa in San Juan also. Okay, let's talk about surface water. So, so Mill Creek, um, we, you know, once again, Mill Creek comes down and goes through the Sheely Tunnel into Ken's Lake. Some of the water continues down and it goes down through the city. Uh, we have developed a feas feasibility idea that you have uh, storage someplace on the east side of Moab, maybe collect some more of that water in a in a, in a tank or or, an, or a pond, and then let it gravity flow to the city. If if you go south of Moab with this water, it would take a booster station, pumping station, and can and you know transmission conveyance. Th this idea. Uh, may have Mara. We really don't know yet. We, we need to have more study on the flow rates and, and uh, really need to establish goals of how much in-stream flow you want to maintain. Uh, if you do a detailed study for several years measuring the flows, you may find that there is some water to use. You may find that there's not. But anyway, that's that's one of the ideas that, that we've come up with. Uh, this This figure shows how it would work, how it would work. Um, kind of at the top mid left of the page, there's a yellow storage tank that that's just the mouth of the canyon. And then it shows a conceptual gravity pipeline. The good thing about moving the water north is it could be conveyed under gravity and wouldn't need to be pumped. If, if we had it, uh, have it go to the south part of the valley, then it would need to go through more transmission in a, a series of storage storage tanks and pump stations. Uh, Colorado River. So uh, we say single or dual system. The one one option, if we just want to talk about using Colorado River for outdoor water, is that we would we would pull water out of the river, we would run it through a settling basin so that a lot of the dirts and silts and sands come out. And then it could be pumped to different locations, obviously through pump, pumping stations, storage tanks, and transmission lines. And it could be used for out outdoor use. Uh, as as more of that water is used for, I say more, none of none is right now, right? But as as it if if this plan is developed and that water is used outdoor, then it would uh, reduce demand on the drinking water system. So uh, a greater number of people could be served in the drinking water system, um, and 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 also, of course, a greater number of acres could be served without outdoor use. Now, the other thing you could do is also take the water and run it through a municipal treatment plant to clean it up enough for indoor use and you could also do the same thing where you have a series of pump stations and storage tanks and you can use it for uh, indoor use now I, I have a comment on their water rights may restrict available volume we we know that um, there's a lot of demand on the river there there are a lot of water rights even in Utah that already lay claim to it and so it it may be difficult but once again, you could pursue it and, and see uh, whether you were able to, to accomplish uh, uh, another water supply from the Colorado River. Here, here's a picture of how that might look. Once again, on the left side of the page, kind of toward the top, you can see a little gray uh, pump at the river. That would be one location where it could possibly be taken out. Uh, there could be a treatment plant there and then through a, a series of, you know, storage tanks, pump stations, and transmission lines, it could be moved throughout the valley. Uh, aquifer storage and recovery wells and surface infiltration basins. Uh, we, we have listed this because uh, it's an idea that has been done in other places, although we're not sure that it would work for your aquifer because just of the, the way your aquifer works and you have, have the, the multiple aquifers. Um, <laughs> basically, the idea is that uh, sometimes in the, in the winter when people have more 
water available, then say the summer, they will try to inject it into the groundwater, uh, either through a well or, or through uh, infiltration basin. Once again, if you're interested, you could pursue that. Like I said, I, I think uh, you, you could proceed cautiously with this. I'm, I'm not sure your aquifers are well positioned for this, but uh, you know, additional study may, may show otherwise. Okay, so here are some costs. And we have we have generally listed these as uh, less expensive um, at the top and more expensive at the bottom. Although we have also tried to group them with similar kinds of projects. Now you you look at the the costs. Uh, we have the column called estimated project cost. That's essentially the capital cost. It seems very very large. Um, it is, but when these projects are developed over 50 years or more, and when they're um, developed maybe when the community is, is quite a bit larger than it is right now, the, the costs become really more reasonable on a, on a per thousand gallon or acre foot basis. So yeah, they, they are huge numbers without a doubt, but um, over time, uh, it, you know, they, they can work out. Um, if you look at costs, uh, as we have in, the, say, the Salt Lake Valley, the per acre foot costs can become quite large. Um, but once again, you get, an, a, a, you know, en enough people using the water wisely and, and it can pay for itself. So here we go with uh, item one would be the conservation and outdoor watering restrictions. Um, that's essentially showing administrative costs over uh, quite a few years. Uh, number two, groundwater monitoring system. We talked about that. Uh, that may include some automated groundwater monitoring in some wells. That That's part of that cost. Uh, number three, agricultural water efficiency program is essentially administrative in nature. You, you might have a department in the city or you might form a district that helps uh, administer that. There could be some outreach reach with that. Uh, and so that there is a cost there. Uh, next, uh, cost-wise, the, the wells would be uh, a very attractive option in terms of cost. Wells, uh, tend to produce a lot of good, clean water without the need for much treatment. And, and they, they tend to be, over time, very cost effective. And so, and, and the other thing that's nice about wells is you, you can build bigger ones and smaller ones. They're very scalable, uh, as opposed to a, a water treatment plant you, usually is, you know, is, is quite a bit bigger, although there are exceptions. Uh, but the wells tend to be simple, scalable, and effective. Uh, then we get down into the gray water and reuse systems for commercial and residential. Though those two, the costs uh, we have cost shown, but it's not really cost to the communities. That that's really something those folks would mostly do themselves. Uh, but but there is a cost associated with that. Uh, now, now, if the city uh, or or Gwisa or the county decided that they wanted to pursue that you know, you, you could pursue funding or, you know, provide funding potentially, uh, reimburse people that are willing to do it. And so, so that is possible. Number nine, uh, we talked about reuse of treated water from the Moab treatment plant. Now it would take more treatment than the treatment train you have right now. It would be a higher qu water quality level. And so, so there would be a lot of uh, expense to that. And, and of course the pumping and transmission costs would be high. But it, it is a source that is very real and, and is right there. And that source will grow as the community grows. Uh, we talk about the irrigation systems, it, uh, 10, 11, 12. Though those are certainly possible. Many communities have them. Uh, they uh, Now, if you, if you do have a, a pressurized irrigation system, then, of course, the question is, where is the, the water coming for that? You know, that the, the irrigation system isn't the supply. And so those really need to be coupled with another another source of water. 
Uh, item 13, Mill Creek, uh, we, we talked about that. May not be feasible, we'll have to do more research there. Uh, and then of course the Colorado River options could require a lot of treatment, certainly would require some uh, pumping capacity and transmission capacity that you don't have right now. Storage as well would be needed. Uh, but uh, if you get the water rights in order and you and you want to go after that, it's it's not hard to find, right? <laughs> okay, next steps in the study. We're going to have a, a stakeholder workshop, get some more input on November 7th. We're going to prepare a draft uh, plan, let folks review that and, and give their comments. Uh, we'll present that in a public meeting, and then we'll finalize the report. Okay, now that's a mouthful I, I had. I'm sure there are a lot of questions, and uh, be glad to uh, entertain those. So, Ben, what we'd like to do is uh, give the focus group an opportunity to ask questions first, is what the format we've been following. So, Luke is the uh, a representative from the city, though we have a couple of other council members on the call. Um, and Dave Ficardi, I think, is a representative from San Juan Special Services District. Um, I'm not quite clear from my looking at the folks on this call if Grand County or Guisa has any board members or commissioners on. Um, so we'd like to give them an opportunity to ask questions first, and then we'll open it up to the public. So uh, Luke, not to call on you, but to call on you, do you have any questions? And then you could probably close your screen maybe. Um, I don't actually at the moment. Um, there's a lot of new information that was presented in here that I'd kind of like to review a little <laughs> bit more closely. Uh, but yeah, I really appreciate all the work that's been done. It's, it's very clear that a lot of progress has been made since we last met. So thank you everybody for all the work that you put in on this. Thank you. Um, David, do you have any questions at this point? Uh, the only question, well, <clears throat> so far the questions I have are this report that we've seen with these iterations of the potential project maps, is this all going to go on the city website so everyone here can take a look at that and digest it more? Um, ben, do you think that's, I mean, I, I think we can do that with preliminary or draft on them. I just, some of these are graphics are pretty big. Uh, do you think we could technically do that, Ben or Katie? Do you think we can reduce those enough to put, put them on our website? Yeah, I'm sure we can. You know, if, if that's what you would like to do, we'll, we'll, we'll make it work. Yeah. Yeah. So we'll do that. They're going to be their draft. As Ben said, you know, we, we keep getting new information. We keep refining this stuff. And certainly when we come to the November 7th meeting, we'll have all the, uh, this stuff available then, but yeah, we'll try and get it on the website, David. Okay. And then, uh, I also anticipate a lot of questions and concerns <clears throat> about the water table. And so, whatever information we have in there about monitoring the water table and plans for that uh, now and in the future. Um, I, I don't know how much a part of that can be put in this plan, but I think just mentioning that and sources for people to find that information would be really helpful to okay. alleviate some concerns about having the water drop out from under us without people realizing it. I mean, I know that we're planning on monitoring. There are plans for monitoring water levels. Water levels are being monitored currently. You know, it's not like we're doing this in a vacuum, but I just think that having a source for the public to see that information would be really useful. Yeah, I'm not sure if we'll do that as part of this project, but I do know that Grand County is, um, and I'm gonna mix this up and Mark, you can correct me if you know the exact title, please, Mark Stilson, but, uh, they're a member of the National Groundwater Monitoring Network, and I think they are, you know, going to become the guardians, if they're not already, of collecting all that data and making it available. But we'll check into it. Mark, did I get that right, do you think, or close to it, if you wouldn't mind? You did. That's exactly right. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Um, anything else, David? Uh, that's it for me. 
Okay, if there's a Lisa or Grand County Commissioner on here that I don't recognize your name, I apologize. If you have questions, otherwise we'll fall back to our city council members and then we'll open it up to the public. No, okay. Um, Ronnie or Kaylin, do you have any questions? No, not at this time. Okay. Ronnie, do you? Yes. Okay, so we'll open it up to questions. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, sorry. Nothing for me. Thanks. Okay. Uh, okay, great. So I think we've gone through elected officials. Uh, we'd like to open it up to members of the public who are on the call. Um, I don't know if you know how to use, the, put your hand up. Otherwise, let's just start and we'll sort it out. Uh, anyone who has any questions, uh, go ahead and ask. We'll do our best to answer. Um, this is John Weiss. I have a question. Um, <clears throat> So um, in 2010, um, Jerry Olds, uh, this was about the uh, diversion for the Green River nuclear power plant, said that, you know, we're going to get 50,000 acre feet of water from the Green River for our nuclear power plant. And um, so I called the Bureau of Reclamation the next day and asked them if they could do that. Just And they said, no, they need to get a contract for that water right. So my question to you is, have you approached the Bureau of Reclamation about contracting Colorado River water? No, we have not. Okay, so um, <clears throat> I think that that needs to be done um, because that would change the amount of water you may or may not get. It would change the costs for the study and things of that nature. So um, I'm just gonna put that out there for now. Thanks. Yeah, thanks for that comment. We'll look into that. And okay. thanks thanks for doing a great job. I appreciated the uh, extra effort to um, clarify confusion. Welcome. Thanks, John. Any other questions for us? Um, this is Dan Stent. I have a couple of questions, Chuck, if not appropriate. Sure. Um, I noticed that all the projections for population and usage and all that stuff um, didn't go back in time at all. Um, and look at like the last 30 or 40 years worth of data and usage and population numbers. And I was wondering why that was and why that wasn't reflected. Because my understanding that water usage has been fairly flat um, for some time in Moab. Yeah, I mean, that, that that's a good question, Dan. Um, what we have seen is that uh, a few years ago, the plumbing codes changed to to require low water use fixtures. And at the time that the codes came into to effect, of course, it didn't change what anybody had in their house. But as new construction has moved forward and as people have changed fixtures in their houses, uh, those savings have been realized and, and in fact are very real. And so there, there has been uh, a, a process uh, wherein a, a lot of the water use has remained relatively flat, um, sometimes with uh, growth patterns as housing becomes denser. The amount of, of outdoor water use or the types of use have changed, which have also had the same effect. Um, I, I think we're in a little bit of a honeymoon period with that now, which will will change and we will see it really start climbing again. P part of the way we view this study is that uh, we 
we want to make a reasonable attempt to 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 estimate how much water is used, but there are a lot of unknowns. And one of the dangers is uh, estimating or being too optimistic about people using less water than than they might use. Uh, at least that's our view. And so we 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 want to be in the realistic realm, but may, maybe aiming a little high. We hope so that um, as time goes on, maybe we can uh, get away with lower water use. But uh, in case those patterns don't develop the way they might meaning less less water use, uh, we, we want to make sure we, we, I guess we want to make sure our projections are high enough. So that, that's sort of our philosophy. And then the other thing I would add to that is that we took the water usage estimates from the city's and the agency's master plans. And so that is where the past usage was evaluated in coming up with what the usage should be in the master plan to confirm whether the state standards were reasonable or not. And yeah, so I think that is, we didn't look at that directly ourselves, but others have looked at that and we've incorporated that information. Yeah, you're right, Katie. We we did look at the master plans, although we, we did, um, just with our experience, look as to whether we thought they were in the realm of being reasonable and consistent with what we had seen elsewhere. And and we, um, I mean, for the MOAP master plan, I wrote it, so I hope I agree with myself. But for, uh, you know, the, the other ones we, we looked at, uh, we found that they were done reasonably also. Dan, did you have a follow-up question or another question also? Um, the, the the outdoor water usage and indoor water usage numbers um, were not real clear in the charts that were provided as far as the separation between those two. And I understand there's there's a lot of factors that go into that, but just kind of looking at what was put there and showing Mill Creek and Gwissa and all that, it seems that the outdoor usage is probably larger than indoor usage. Um, and that seems to be a fairly significant component to any future planning. Um, I think you're right. I mean, I look, I saw those numbers yeah. a few hours ago and I did a quick calculation and uh, using those total numbers, 58% of the water used is outdoor irrigation. So over half, you're correct. But, you know, we have Moab Irrigation Company they're in the irrigating business and that I'm going from memory, but I think they have like 1200 or 1700 acre feet per year that they have the ability to, uh, to, to utilize. And then WISA has a large component. The city does not have a secondary irrigation system. We use other method, methods to figure out, you know, a random sampling of lot sizes and that, and then evapotranspiration rates and such. But yeah, your your comment's correct. Uh, we use a lot of outdoor irrigation water in this valley, and and I think that's one reason why we're we looked at or we are looking at as a potential the wastewater treatment plant and or the Colorado River as a secondary irrigation uh, source. Potentially, they're expensive. I'm not saying it's going to happen by any means. But that water could more likely be used for secondary irrigation than, than that frees up some of this other water for culinary purposes, whether it's a recharge project or a direct use. Yeah, I definitely think it's something that needs to be, you know, factored into these future use projections and population numbers and stuff like that, because it's such a large component of the current usage. Um, so, you know, I don't know the best way to, to roll that in, but that was an observation. And then the, the last question that I have is, um, you know, in the 24 years that I've been in Moab, I think almost continuously, you know, with a few gaps of maybe two or three years, there's been studies on the groundwater, um, resource here um, and there's been a lot of funding put into studies by USGS, by wow. UGS, by Moab City, by other entities and 
every single one of them seems to come up with a result that more studies are needed. And, you know, I'm, I'm an engineer, I'm in the game of doing that sort of thing, but it's, it's very frustrating to see um, the amount of money that's been spent on doing these groundwater studies with very little tangible results. And I understand that groundwater is a, is a difficult thing to capture, but um, I, I wonder if there's some guidance that could be given from this report as to how to structure. I mean, you did talk about drilling some monitoring wells, and obviously I think that would be a good first start for sure um, and doing some other steps there. But um, I'm sure the general public is frustrated at the amount of money that's been spent on groundwater studies with very little conclusive results from that. Maybe Mark yeah. can speak to that some. Yeah, Dan, um, I'll, I'll, let, let me just say one thing, and then I'm sure Mark can, can offer a far more intelligent comment, intelligent comment than mine, but um, there, there have been a lot of good studies and, and, they're, and they're good and they are based on underlying data, existing wells and, and good models and so on. As you get, um, as you want to fine tune your, these models and the understanding it, it becomes a lot it, it becomes a lot tougher to get it right when you really want to fine tune it and understand it well. And I have seen communities that, that do that that have uh, great data in, in in spread over a a wide area with wells in key locations. and it is possible to be quite accurate uh, when you have the data. And so so what what happens a lot of times is that, People do the best they can at the time. They'll look at geology, which is often based on, you know, surface features. They'll look at uh, existing wells and, and, you know, they can look at water quality. Th there are a lot of good tools um, that, that can get you a long way. But when, when you really want to start uh, fine tuning it, 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 it's tougher. And I think that's the step we're at now that we need to get a lot more precise data on a consistent basis. To help fine tune these models, and and so, you know, the work that's been done in the past is very valuable, uh, and I think it just set us up for the next step. And Mark, if I got that wrong, please correct me. <laughs> no, that's that's exactly right. The uh, 2019 USGS study was a great study, and it provided a wealth of new information to us, and it it did allow us to refine our estimates of um, what the groundwater recharge uh, potentially is for Moab Spanish Valley. Previously, we had used an estimate of around 14,000 acre feet. And, and this would be for the aquifer, aquifers under the valley floor. The 2019 USGS study came up with an estimate of between 14 and 16,000 acre feet of recharge but that included the mountainous region. And so when we did our analysis of the report in 2020, <clears throat> we refined that and came up with an estimate of between 4,500 and essentially uh, 8,000. So a pretty big range, but that's probably the best we could do given uh, the limits of that study. So that study was a big picture, 30,000 foot view, and it identified several different things that we need to do to refine it. And we've highlighted that, in our opinion, there's three areas that need some additional work. Uh, one is down at the Colorado River interface. And UGS yeah. is just completing a uh, study now that should be available in March that looks at that a little bit closer. Um, the second area is in the mid part of the valley around the golf course. And then the third area is up at the uh, uh, top of the valley uh, around Ken's Lake and Pat Creek. Um, what the 2019 report did identify is that there's some interchange of water between the aquifers. 
So water is moving between the Valley Fill Aquifer and the Glen Canyon Group Aquifer, and they they separated the Glen Canyon Group Aquifer into a shallow layer into a deeper layer. What what they were not able to do is define the, that dynamic. So um, we we uh, in our analysis said of that range, 4,500 to 8,000, some of that's already in use. And, and we stated that there's probably between um, 1,300 and 3,500 acre feet that might be still available for use from the groundwater resources. But we don't know what aquifer that is from. <laughs> It might be all from the Valley Fill Aquifer. Uh, the scientists who did the 2019 report uh, published a research paper in 2020 and went into some more analysis and detail. And they refined their estimates a little bit more using a lump parameter model, uh, which was great. And th they could be right on or they could be off a little bit. They used a, a lot of assumptions. And so we've said, hey, let's look at those assumptions. Let's take what they did and uh, use that as a basis to guide our uh, research going forward. So yeah, I think just as what Ben mentioned and as Chuck has talked about, um, we have a lot of great new data but the intent of that study was not to get down into the weeds. It was a big basin-wide study. So, yeah, and I'll just thank you, Mark. I, I I agree with you said, and as you know, I I agree with your numbers on the amount of potential water that's still in the aquifer, the thirteen hundred to thirty-five hundred. I I concur with that. But what I wanted to say, Dan, is I. I sense the frustrations that some people have with, oh, another study, why are we doing it? And I know those aren't your exact words, but um, part of it is, I just want to say, is that the Glen Canyon group okay. is a complex aquifer. It's not a large sediment filled alluvial basin that goes a thousand feet down, right? It's fractured sandstone with cracks and joints and uh, a lot of classic geology uh, is used, but using some of the assumptions that are used in groundwater modeling and other places um, just won't apply. So it's a complex aquifer is my point. And so I think we just kind of keep building, even though this study that we're doing here that Ben's presented, we're not doing that right now. We're not doing another hydrogeology study. We're Right, right. Yeah, I got that out of it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, thank, thank you all three of you for that information. I appreciate that very much. Thank you. Thanks, Dan. Anyone else have any questions? Yeah, <coughs> I do. Alan? Oh, once I clear my throat. Um, <clears throat> so is the pricing for the secondary irrigation systems, does it assume that <clears throat> pipes will just be put in as part of that project or if they were to be installed piecemeal as trenches were open in streets, would that affect the pricing? Yeah, so uh, Katie, jump in here if I've got this wrong. But I mean, that's basically to go in and construct the, that that dollar amount is to go in and just construct a, a system throughout the city. Now, it, it could be rolled out uh, somewhat piecemeal, although, you know, if, if you spend a lot on your source, um, I mean, let's just go with the Colorado River idea. You do a pump station and, and transmission line, then you you really want to get enough customers on the other end to start paying for that. And and so, you you could do a pilot study or you could do it you know part way. But a, a lot of times with with those systems, you just kind of have to jump in, uh, both feed at once, and so you can get you know you get your funding in place via via loans in many cases. And then get a bunch of users in in the you know in the in the in the user base paying fees, and and then that's the way the way you pay to pay it off. 
And yeah. yeah, I would say that it our cost estimate did assume brand new, or you know, that we are we are constructing the all of that piping that we showed on the maps. And for city of Moab, that's pretty accurate because the city, all the streets are already in for the most part, and we'd be doing construction in existing streets. Um, San Juan is completely the opposite. Very little is in right now. So very little of that would be retroactive. And most of it would come in as the new developments are constructed. And so in that case, it would just be part of the cost of constructing a development. Um, but we still included the costs because it gets paid for somehow, whether it's by the developer as they come into the city or whether it's by the city in a project. Yeah, and, and I would just quickly add that, Kaylin, one of the things is we've talked it out internally about if we were to go with a secondary irrigation system here in the city, since we don't have one, we might find a way to turn our 60 year old culinary pipes into the secondary irrigation system, distribution system, and then install new culinary pipes, which might, you know, get us more bang for the buck, so to speak, potentially lower costs. I'm not quite sure yet. Right. Thanks all. Yeah. Um, other questions? All right. Well, hearing none. Oh, someone had one? I'm sorry. Did someone have a question? I'll go. I'll, yeah, I'll go. Mr. John Weisheit. So uh, back to the Bureau of Reclamation, they're currently doing the um, an environmental impact statement. It's going the draft EIS is going to come out probably the end of 2024, and I think that data might be very useful. Um, there are going to be climate projections, supply and demand projections that will have a much clearer um, interpretation of the future as compared to the 2012 uh, bit water supply and demand study. So um, when that when that comes out, um, I think, um, you know, I'll certainly bring it to your attention, but um, I think it's good to put a place mark on that right now so that when it does come, you, you know, it might help that's a year away, maybe, I mean, actually it's more than a year away, but, um, and then it would be very interesting to see what the academics, how they tear it apart or, or complement it. And I think that information would be helpful to the community. What project is that associated with, John? Um, it's um, the reconsultation of the 2007 interim guidelines and it's called the post 2026 process. Mark may have just posted something in the chat, I think. Anyway, thank you. Good job, everybody. Yeah, thank you. And the one thing I, I would say that, you know, I, I always pick bits of data and try and do QAQC and just, but I think it's worth saying, you know, Colorado River there is something we consider because this is work that's never been done on that is comprehensive basis. But at the 10,000 acre feet that I think uh, Ben's number, his team's number had, that we potentially would pull out of acre feet per year of the Colorado, that translates to 14 CFS. And for everybody, you know, I think probably most people on this call are river runners one way or the other. Um, it's not the 200,000 acre feet that Phoenix pulls out at the lower end. Every year, it's it's 15 CFS in order to get 10, translates to 10,000 acre feet per year. So I I just want to throw that as out as those are the types of numbers that we've been talking about. So thank you. And thanks, John, for that information. Well, um, yeah, but the system is already down three to oh. four million acre feet. So that's yeah. the issue. Yeah. I, I'm not saying that that should be a deciding factor. I'm just letting people know from a perspective of CFS is when we're boating on the river, we don't think of acre feet per year going down the river. We think of say That's all. I, 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 that number was important for me to convey. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. 
Any other questions? We've got a few minutes. If... I can't tell if someone's asking or if that's someone in the background. I think that's just the feedback from um, yours and Ben's microphones. Oh, okay. Well, if there are no other questions, I guess I'd say that we could uh, end the call and with a thank you very much to everyone, both the project team and and to all the members of the public and the focus groups for taking time out of your evening. And uh, we'll try and get a lot of this information posted on the website. Otherwise, I'd encourage everyone who has the opportunity to come to our November 7th uh, focus our workshop over at the Grand Center. I believe it's from five to seven, but we'll post it um, on the website and send out social media. Thank you. Good night. Thank you.